Check Complete, a referee podcast, is an educational resource for referees by referees, designed to connect and develop soccer officials of all ages and skill levels to better serve the game both on and off the field. It's time for episode 15 of the Check Complete podcast. Gordy, your host here, excited for a really uh, content-packed episode of the Check Complete podcast. And I'm thrilled to have Zed Umar next to me today. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I'm super thrilled that you were able to be able to make this work. We have some time. I know you're a very busy man. We'll talk about that very, very shortly here. But um, we've got some great content today. So Zed, we're going to talk with Zed um, a little bit here. And then uh, we'll sit down with Pro AR, uh, who we've gotten used to and, and gotten to know quite a bit, Jeff Swartzel, to talk about self-reflection and the importance of that practice, as well as uh, kind of provide some tools for you as you go about doing the games that you do, whatever level, it doesn't matter. Uh, the importance of self- self-reflection is uh, it's paramount. Uh, and then I sit down over Zoom with uh, Dr. Joe Matchnik. So a really exciting interview with him as we hear about uh, just someone who's seen the landscape of soccer for quite some time and has a, a very r- rich perspective on how soccer and specifically officiating has progressed. Um, and of course, Dr. Joe has is still very, very involved. He's getting ready to go to Qatar to be a part of the uh, broadcast team for the World Cup as an analyst alongside Mark Clattenburg and a very esteemed group of people. So pretty exciting to be able to chat with him. Um, so we're really excited about that. But Zed... Um, Thank you again for taking time to do this. This is awesome. Of course, of course. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So how long, let's just jump in kind of tell some of your story. Uh, how long have you been, well, let me just ask, who, who are you? Let's start with that. Well, uh, I'm Zed. Uh, I'm Zed Amar. I am 22. I am local. I grew up in Texas, but I've been in Kansas for over 11 years now. I just graduated college. I'm a current grad student, and I'm on the track to medical school, hopefully, uh, provided I, you know cross my T's and dot my eyes. There you go. But yeah, I mean, I've been officiating. I'll kind of yeah, yeah, get into it. it for you. But uh, I started officiating because I thought it was a cool gig. And I was, I think, I was 11 and a half, but I was a tall 11 and a half year old. Mm. So the the referee shortage was uh, not nearly as bad then, but it was still pretty pretty ubiquitous at the sure. time. But um, uh, I got certified. My parents were livid that I was about to spend $150 on jerseys for a occupation I hadn't gone and worked a day at yet. Yeah. But um and I just never stopped. The people were amazing. The opportunities that have been presented to me through it are amazing. I never had to have another job through all of high school and college. It paid for everything. But yeah, I mean that's a little bit about me. But yeah. It's a good time. I love it. Yeah. And so you're still <clears throat> like you said, you just finished college and you're on the medical school track and doing all that kind of stuff. Very busy on that side of things and still manage to kind of make time. To referee, what's that been like? What's that balance been like? Because I'm sure there's people that are listening that, um, for whatever, we know that refereeing isn't all of life for for majority of us, right? There's always these other <clears throat> pursuits and um, the the stuff that pays the bills, the full time gigs, all that kind of stuff. What's balancing been like for you? Sure. Um, honestly, it, it's funny enough. Refereeing is the thing that truly keeps me balanced. Um, I. I'm fortunate enough that I get to spend time with the people that I consider closest to me in life, yeah. truthfully. I mean, you, you as well as all of our listeners and anyone that has dabbled in what we're talking about here and what we do as referees can attest to this. I mean, yeah. these are our closest, most meaningful friendships. Sure. And our relationships that come out of this are long-lasting. Um, but just with my schedule, I mean, I will admit the volume that I work at now is not nearly what it was when I was younger. Um, I was able to do a lot more then, but... Um, the level of game has kind of, thankfully, I mean, I've been very fortunate and I'm very humbled by what I'm able to do, but the level of game has kind of increased. And so it's offset a little bit of that, um, volume of game. But I mean, I will typically utilize my weekends quite a bit for my games. Mm -hmm. Uh, my blocks are set for about five to 6 PM because that's normally what I I work full time as well. And so, Mm -hmm. um, that's normally what I like to do, but I mean, it is true that it pays a good chunk of my bills, but it also mm-hmm. is, you know, it's how I satisfy the other side of my brain. I mean, it's, yeah. I fell in love with this sport at three, four years old and, you know, it's, that's just never gone away. That itch to be near it. And then mm-hmm. also, you know, thankfully we were able to find a way to, we didn't monetize it on purpose, but it did happen. And, right. and you know, and so that's kind of, I mean, I try to do my best. I try to, I also, uh, I have a girlfriend. Hi, Callie. Um, and I get, uh, I'm really fortunate to be able to spend time with her, but She's, you know, a big part of balance is 
having good people around you that support you in what you do, yes. you know, and I'm very fortunate that, like I said, I mean, a good chunk of my community is our referees, you know, right. but it's also family members and she's also super supportive and, you know, enjoys coming to my games and is slowly learning more of the game and asking questions yeah. and stuff like that. And so that also gives me a boost to keep it up, you know, and there have absolutely been times where I've, I've figured, you know, maybe I should take a back seat now. Maybe this should be when I, you know, kind of let focus on other things. But I mean, it's been... I haven't had to do that because I've had that support. So I think support's a huge thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, what I'm hearing there is the support piece, but also just being attentive and um, being diligent with some planning. Oh, yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> it's okay to set blocks for for whatever you need to set, even if it's just setting blocks for, for I, don't, I don't have something going on, but for my own sanity. Oh, yeah. I can't oh, do yeah. this. Um, and you don't realize how much you need that when you're younger. It really is until you're, you know, until it, is, it isn't until your responsibilities as an adult, which I say tentatively because I don't want to claim that fully for myself. Yet. <laughs> but, um, but um, it isn't until then that you kind of realize how much you need that time. Yeah. And I think a big part of it is also communication, which I'm sure you'll attest to that yeah. if you're proactive in your communication, um, assigners will appreciate you all that much more. Fellow referees will appreciate you that much more. Um, obviously, emergencies happen and extraneous circumstances are you know, ever present in what we do mm -hmm. just in life. But um, I found that, you know, in, in times where I felt like I needed to, you know, give up a game or maybe not do as much as I had initially taken on, um, being proactive and communicating with, you know, like I said, assigners and fellow, you know, people that we work mm -hmm. with is huge. And it goes a long way because people, you know, if you give them enough time to plan, they'll understand that we're all yeah. human and we need to there are times we do need to, you know, take our foot off the gas a little bit. And so that's, you know, communication, I think, is also a big thing that allows me to be able to balance what I do yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we kind of wrap up this portion of our of the podcast mm -hmm. today, the conversation with you, I, I will derail from soccer a little bit. Where do you see yourself as far as your pursuit in the medical field? Where, is your, where are your passions? Where do you hope to see that go? Sure. Um, well, I hope to be useful. <laughs> I guess that's like mm -hmm. the, that's my underlying thing. I've always wanted to, you know, I've always wanted to de dedicate my life to servitude and to work for, you know, my community and for communities across the world. Um, currently, I'm getting my master's in public health. And so that's something that didn't really develop for me as an interest or something I even thought was an interest until my last year of college and until, you know, COVID really, you know, took over mm -hmm. the world. And, you know, we all know how, you know, present that has been in our world and it kind of spurred in me this you know just this need to understand how we as a society in america and how we as a as a world as a universe like deal with things like that and plan for yeah. things like that and you know i do want to go on to medical school that is something that ideally in five years that is the track that is where i'll be at i'll be hopefully finishing up medical school um but i wanted to go get this degree right now and spend the time right now because i eventually want to i mean you know, lofty goals aside, like I really just want to understand what my community needs and what that looks like. How can we be better prepared, you know, not just in a, in a you know, infrastructure standpoint, not just in terms of financial resources, but just in knowledge, yeah. just in community. You know, I feel like so much of that was lost. There was so much fear and there was so much disinformation and so much, you know, we lost our sense of community, you know, and I think that a lot of that can be assuaged not only with, you know, literature and fancy papers and people in coats, it can, you know, it's, it's human. It's, it's us going and interacting with people, teaching people on a human level, mm -hmm. talking to them where they're at and not talking at them, you know? And so that's kind of where I want to go. I want mm -hmm. to eventually be the, like a chief medical officer for a hospital. That'd be mm -hmm. great. I want to run my own practices ideally because I don't believe in putting healthcare behind a paywall. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I think access is everything. And so, yeah, I would love to, I would love to be in medical school. But uh, I also am not going to beat my head against the grindstone, you know, so mm -hmm. if that's not something that pans out, I'm more than happy to jump ship a little bit and go find another way to be useful. Sure. So. That's beautiful. <clears throat> well, we are very proud of you in the state of Kansas, all of your contemporaries here. We're proud of you and are excited to see where that goes, both as a referee and outside of the pitch as well. Um, I, I will volunteer this, and I, I, I think I know you well enough that you are willing to do this. If you find yourself in a similar boat or looking at this same kind of path, um, I know you would probably be more than happy to have conversations with anybody in that boat. Absolutely. So we'll put we'll put your name, address, social security number, phone number. Yeah, up, yeah, everything. All blood that. type. It, blood type. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no we'll, we'll tag you in yeah. our posts. Um, 
feel free to reach out. I know you've got all the socials mm -hmm. and the Insta faces. Oh yeah, and the I'm, a, I'm an important person. You, but he has many <laughs> leather bound books. Oh. Yes. No, but um, no, he's he is he uh, would be. I, yeah, I, I know you'd be a great person to connect with. And if you're in that as a younger official or even someone who's making a career change or something going into the medical field or wondering, can I balance this? What does this look like? If any of that resonates with you, I know Zed is somebody that would be more than happy to connect with you. Is that true? It absolutely is. And yeah. uh, I will absolutely not claim to have all the answers, but if you reach out, we can figure it out together. And he's a good one to figure it out together with. He'll, he's a good conversation partner. So um, thanks again for your time today. Uh, we'll come back to you after we chat, after I chat with Jeff and with Dr. Joe. And uh, we'll conclude the episode, but appreciate your time. Of course. There. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So now we'll go to a conversation with Pro AR Jeff Swartzel to talk about the importance of self-reflection and hopefully give you some tools to practice that in your games in the future. The Check Complete podcast is brought to you in part by JF Consulting Tax Preparation and Bookkeeping. Taxes suck. We can help. Visit jfcokc.com. Well, I'm super excited to be back with Jeff Swartzel, Pro AR. Um, Jeff, thank you for making more time for the Check Complete podcast. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you, Gordy. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, I'm excited about this. So we're going to talk about uh, um, self-reflection or self-assessment and the role that that's played in your career, what you do as a regular practice in the games that you work, and then some basic tenets for you know anybody at any level, what they can incorporate into their uh, routine as they're going around working games. So let's start with um, in your progression as as a referee, and and you're you're at the highest level in the domestic league in the United States. What role has self reflection and self assessment played for you? Uh, I would say that it is the likely the most important thing I've done. Um, you know, if, if we can all be honest with ourselves for a moment, um, everybody else is analyzing us. And a lot of times that analysis is not fair. It's not uh, based on the laws of the game. It's certainly uh, viewed with a biased eye. And so um, self-reflection was the only way in most cases that I was able to get feedback on myself. Um, you know, certainly we could rely on our fellow officials for some of that, but um, no one is ever harder, uh, you know, than myself. I was always the hardest on me. So um, that that process uh, was what allowed me to learn and know the kinds of questions I should be asking um, and then helped me go out and find who could give me those answers. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And you're so right. We've got so many eyes looking at us. So let's be fair with ourselves, but also be honest with ourselves. So let's talk about that. How do you do that now? What's that practice look like for you in the games you're working regularly now? Sure. Um, well, certainly, you know, I have the benefit of having um, all of my games televised. Um, that gives me access to, you know, a number of different cameras in the stadium. And so, um, you know, when I'm able to watch back a game that I certainly get the most clarity I've ever gotten. Um, but if you're a different kind of official, you know, college games are mostly televised, even some high school games are taped. So, um, you know, the process for me starts with actually getting to watch the game. Um, I wrote down a handful of things that I thought every self-analysis should have. Um, it, it has to start with accuracy of decision-making. Um, for mm -hmm. an assistant referee like me, that's going to be offside and, and fouls inside my area. Um, so I'm certainly looking at all of my big moments in the match where I made decisions that, um, you know, went one way or the other. Um, uh, two, th there should be some focus on uh, what you're trying to work on. Um, I believe I made a name for myself uh, with my work rate. So I'm always jotting down, you know, moments where I thought I worked very hard or moments where I thought I could work a little bit harder. Um, but that might be positioning. It could be game management. It could be communication or mechanics. Um, if you've never watched yourself on tape, boy, you'll be surprised what you look like. Um, you know, if you hope to be on ESPN one day, then, um, you know, take a look at yeah, what you look like on TV and see if you fit the same mold. Um, number three, I think that we should celebrate our good moments. Um, you know, we're all good officials and we make good decisions. And when you see those in your own game, don't just blow past them, you know, be excited, um, you know, that you worked hard or you made a good decision, you're in the right place and you, you did something good. Um, and of course, we're going to have some bad moments. Um, and I find that those require brutal honesty. Um, you know, no, no one reads my self-reflections, so I can be as honest as I have to be um, in the expectations I have for myself. 
Um, and then last, I wrote find a mentor. Um, you know, a lot of times I identify things that I want to fix and I don't exactly know how to. And um, I've been fortunate through my career to have a number of people I could go to um, and ask questions when I didn't know the answer and ask how they might do it better or differently. Um, some of those mentors turn out to be colleagues and friends in the MLS. Some of them have been coaches, some of them have been administrators. Um, you know, don't, don't ever take someone's perspective for granted because um, you never know the right one that'll fit your game. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, you, you and I had talked a little bit more about some of the other things that are kind of unique to what you're getting to do with, with travel and some other stuff. I'm just curious, would you be willing to share some of what that looks like for you? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so I usually journal about two pages per game that I work. Um, and I like to cover those five points that I just mentioned there, but um, I also take a fair amount of notes about other logistics around the game. Um, and I do that because I find that I'm most comfortable going to work a match when all of those logistics are figured out. So um, if I've been to uh, a certain stadium before, I'll make notes about that venue. Um, you know, is it a grass field or a turf field? Um, what's the parking situation like? What's the locker room like? Um, you know, sometimes the airports can be confusing. Um, is it easier to get an Uber or ride a train or get a car? Um, sometimes the hotels don't have on-site parking, and so it's easier to be dropped off. And I just find that, you know, when I have delays or problems with travel, it can sometimes throw me out of my rhythm. So I like to make notes about other surrounding events around the game so that the next time I go to a site, um, I'm a little more prepared and things run a little bit smoother. Um, I also write a, a lot of notes about my fellow officials. Um, you know, we certainly have a small group of referees that work in the league and they are all very unique. And I like to take notes about things that they like and that they don't like um, to prepare myself for what kind of game I'm about to go do. Um, so we'll take uh, John Freeman, for example, um, who you've had on the show. Um, he's a close friend of mine and um, he has a very open style of communication. So I know when I work a game with John, um, I'm free to express my opinions and give him information and he's able to filter it out and, and do with it what he will. Um, mm -hmm. But there might be a different official who doesn't like a lot of communication. And so I know mm -hmm. that um, when I work a game with that person, I've got to be a little more quiet. Um, and when I speak, it has to be very intentional and, and at the right moment. So um, all of those notes just help me prepare for the match. Um, I definitely take notes on players. Um, you know, if I if I have an interaction with a coach and I find something did or didn't work, I'll make a note of that so that if I ever see that coach again, um, I'll remember that, uh, you know, he, he did like it when I said this or he really didn't like it when I did that. So um, it just helps me avoid those kind of interactions in the future. I, I love that because I think so much of what's both um, beautiful and maddening about this task is that there is a level of just let's see if this works. You know, we're trying a new, uh, a new tool from our toolbox. Right. Mm -hmm. And so even someone at, at, at your place that's working in the MLS, that there's trial and error for that kind of stuff and, and keeping track of how that works and how it doesn't. I love that. Yeah, there, there definitely is. And remember I'm, I'm a newer guy in the league. Sometimes, you know, I'm seeing a coach for the first time and uh, you know, he might be testing me to see um, how strong I am in front of him. And um, you know, I might, I might be more aggressive with him and try to exude my confidence, or I might be a little more passive and have a listening ear. And, mm -hmm. you know, some coaches respond differently and, you know, you take your chance and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But what I want to make sure I do is write down what I did and how it turned out so that, you know, the next time I see that coach or that player, um, I'll remember that I managed him in a certain way and what that outcome was. And then, yeah. and then I'll make again or try something different. You know, and obviously this doesn't apply to you guys in a specialized role, but those of us that are working games at both positions, there's probably a place in this for what what we saw the referee do that we liked and what we saw the referee do that we didn't like and that we can apply to our next game when we're in that position, right? There's no question. Um, you know, I am constantly watching uh, the referee and I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm, I'm listening to the other assistant referee. And I'm also gauging how people are reacting to that. Um, I want to know, you know, do referees like what, what that person says? And if they do, maybe I'll start saying it. So mm -hmm. um, there is a, a constant analysis going on throughout the game and then after on what is what my teammates are doing uh, so that I can put it into my own game if I like it. 
Um, yeah. You know, I started, uh, you know, refereeing grassroots games and then high school. And um, I learned from every single official I worked with. And, you know, there's certainly been good ones and there's certainly been bad ones, but you can learn just as much from both spectrums. So, um, you know, that's a great thing to reflect back on, on, on what did your fellow officials do and did you like it or didn't you? That's great. So to re to kind of recap, you, you talked about the tenants that you're looking for each time. So accuracy, decision accuracy, especially with our whatever role we played in, what's going to be mm -hmm. more uh, paramount for us that day, what you're trying to work on. And you talked about several different things that that could be. But that also implies that we're going into games with an expectation that I need to work on something and having and that comes out of probably self-awareness and reflection of where I need to grow. Yeah, I think. Definitely. Uh, you know, the, the way that I end those those two pages that I write is I think about the next game. You know, is there something that I want to try to work on for the next game or or have I noticed a trend? Um, maybe my fitness has been a little off. Maybe my work rate's been a little down. You know, do I want to focus something on the next few games to get back to where I want to be? So yeah. um, definitely part of your self-reflection should be planning for the next set of games. Yeah. Yeah. And then celebrating the good moments. I think that's great. Um, and uh, and then being honest in the bad moments and, and finding a mentor. I know for us in the world of I mean, you talked about the access to video shoot with VO and Trace and all these other cameras that are out there. It, it's it's almost every level. You go out in the weekends and there's a U12 game with the VO camera perched up there. Right. So. Absolutely. There's access to it all the time. So finding those things and, you know, I love to do it. I've got people that I know for me, this isn't about me, but when I find a good moment where I feel like I nailed something, it's easy to screen record um, yeah. and, and send that or a bad moment or a funny moment and share those things. Hey, did I, did I screw this up as bad as I did? Yeah, you did. Or you know what? No, maybe not. You know, <laughs> you know, but, at least here in Indiana, I found that, um, you know, our high school officials sometimes ask coaches for the video and the reaction from the coach has always been, boy, if you want to learn and get better, I'd be happy to send you the video. I, yeah. I think teams and these clubs uh, would be happy to provide the referees a tool to get better. Um, oh, it's just on us to ask. So um, yeah. if you're feeling shy, I, I bet they would love to help. That's been the same response here. And the, it goes it speaks volumes um, we've only had one coach and it was at the collegiate level that said, well, I don't want you to know my tactics coming into the game. It's like, <laughs> listen, man, we're, we're not going, we're not scouting. We're just looking right. at what we screwed up that you think, or at least what you thought we screwed right. up. Right. So, right. well, we're going to, I mean, uh, the check complete podcast team is working on a tool out of this conversation that we're going to try to, to make available to you guys, this listeners um, that you can use as a self-reflection tool. So we're still working out the details, what that will look like. We're going to share that out on our social media platforms and things. But um, Jeff has really helped us get the ball rolling and uh, we're gonna incorporate a lot of this. There's a lot out there. So we're trying to compile this. There's a ton of existing resources. So compiling this, but really it, there's not necessarily a perfect thing. I think that the, I don't know if you'd agree with me, Jeff, but I think the, the most important thing is that you're taking time to reflect and you're I, taking time to not miss opportunities to learn. Yeah, I could not say it better. Um, the only wrong way to do this is to not do it. So yeah. if you're, if you're doing anything, you're already, you're already on the right path. Jeff, as always, it's really good to talk to you and we appreciate your perspective, not in just, not just with what's been working for you, but also kind of the intricacies of where you're at in your career. We appreciate you kind of opening the door to letting us see what that looks like for you on a weekly basis. I'm happy to do it. Uh, thank you very much for having me back on. Absolutely. The Check Complete podcast is brought to you in part by JF Consulting Tax Preparation and Bookkeeping. Taxes suck we can help. Visit jfcokc.com. I'm super excited to sit down virtually with Dr. Joe Matchnick. Uh, Dr. Joe, I, I am thrilled and really appreciate you taking time to chat with the Check Complete podcast today. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, you're most welcome. This is exciting uh, for me as well. Um, obviously, I always like to talk about soccer officiating. So it's another opportunity. Thank you for having me with you. Absolutely. Yeah, we certainly love talking about this topic as well. That's that's for sure. So um, let's let's dive right into it. Um, you've got quite the extensive uh, history and experience around the game. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your story, about who you are, where and how you've gotten to where you are today. 
<laughs> it's a long story. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I grew up in New York City and there was always a, a lot of ethnic soccer. Um, and so I watched games in the local park and I was, all, and I was also a hockey fan uh, back in the day when uh, you could go to a New York Ranger game for 40 cents and a high school ID card. <laughs> so, and it was very interesting how uh, hockey refereeing with one referee and two linesmen and soccer refereeing were uh, kind of similar. And, and so I became a fan of, uh, you know, both. And back in the early days of hockey, when there were only six teams, there were only three referees. So, so and, and the linesmen were a local to the respective clubs. So you got to know them, you got to know their styles and, and, and uh, you became, I became interested in that kind of stuff. And uh, when I went to uh, Long Island University on a um, uh, half scholarship for playing soccer, uh, I was a physical education major. And as such, you, you get taught how to teach uh, the various sports, even at a most elementary level, but also how to officiate them. So, so I, I mean, I was able to officiate uh, intramural basketball, volleyball, flag football, intramural soccer, all those things. But obviously, as a soccer aficionado, uh, soccer officiating, um, you know, was my was the one I was best at. So, so uh, when I took the hockey officiating <laughs> exam, I got a hundred on the written part, but couldn't skate that well. And the guy told me not to buy any whistles or suitcases. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that was short lived. Uh, but I started officiating youth soccer in the New York City area um, while playing. Um, and then uh, when my uh, playing career was over, um, and then I was now living in Connecticut. There was a shortage of officials for the Sunday League, uh, the Connecticut State League, and, and uh, they asked a couple of the college coaches, would you volunteer this particular Sunday, the opening of the season? And uh, without taking an exam, without a fitness exam, without anything, the next, the next day I was refereeing like Hartford, Hartford Atlantic against New Britain Falcons. So, so and that's how it all it all uh, began. Wow. Um, I, got, I was fortunate uh, with my hockey background when indoor soccer started mm -hmm. uh, because it was a combination of, of uh, soccer, but played on really a hockey rink with, with the AstroTurf. Um, Walter Chisowitz, who was uh, a consultant for the league, uh, asked me if I would be the referee in chief of the league. And uh, so when that uh, I refereed the first MISL game um, and about over a hundred of them. Um, and one of my biggest uh, thrills, I think, in my career was uh, having grown up in New York City, was refereeing uh, not only the first game, which was in Nassau Coliseum, but also the All-Star game in Madison Square Garden. So, oh, wow. so, so that, was, that was really, really special for me. Um, and since... Uh, the indoors uh, was kind of a really unique challenge for referees. So I was not only a referee in the league, but I ran the program. Uh, mm -hmm. And we eventually had to hire uh, full-time officials to concentrate on that game. It was probably the first uh, full-time referee program maybe in the world, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the United States. Um, and so that experience, um, when, M, when Major League Soccer started and, and in, the, in the first year, they had so many challenges with officiating. And then I was asked to come uh, work for Major League Soccer to, to uh, help coordinate that program with the uh, United Soccer uh, uh, Federation and the Canadian Soccer Federation. And I did that for 15 years. And then as a result of that, I, I got the... Uh, experience of doing some broadcasting, which, which I've been doing for the last 10 years on Fox. Yeah, it's quite the progression. And we're definitely going to get um, a few guys. I think we might have Rich Grady come back on to talk about MASL because it's a whole different beast, like you said. It's a interesting. Yeah. If you, it, and, and I know not everybody has 
uh, one in their market around them. But I know here in Kansas City, I get out to a lot of Comets games, and it is it's a whole different world. That's for sure. Yes, yes it is. And when when indoor started, it was only one referee on the floor, and and another referee in in the uh, in the box right to supervise the penalty boxes, so to speak. And we did that that way. Uh, for the first three or four years in the league. And it was a major yeah. challenge, um, but it also helped create some fabulous referees because you were so close to the players um, and, and you got so good at and at determining advantage, which, uh, which you know, the advantage uh, presented itself off the boards and rebounds and, and all, mm. you know, so, and we wanted a game that was a little bit rock'em sock'em, but fast. Um, and so, and so uh, when referees went from indoors to outdoors, they said, oh, this is a piece of cake. Oh, yeah. Well, even just the management of players, you know, in the in MASL, uh, as it's referred to now, MASL. Um, yeah, it, it creates a lot. We have a lot of the lower levels now, M2 and M3 that are starting up and there's more teams picking up those getting into the the, the MASL atmosphere. And it, it creates a it creates a management, and it just you know when you're inside and everything is kind of closed in on top of you, it it helps a lot of our officials that that transition to the outdoor game in, in several ways, like you said, that makes total sense. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, very cool. That's quite the progression, and everybody's got their own journey, and it's just fascinating to see how life takes its twists and turns. And and now and now here you are. I know we were talking before we were recording. Um, you've got some some fun things coming up uh, here very soon. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, if we're 60 or 50 days away from the beginning of the World Cup in Qatar, and I'm happy to be uh, included on that broadcast team for Fox. Um, myself and uh, Mark Clattenberg will be the rules analyst. Uh, I'm happy there's two of us because <laughs> there's four games a day in the, in the group stage. Uh, back when I did Russia, there was three games a day. I did that by myself. Uh, did uh, all 64 games in front of a monitor and never got to see a game. I, yeah. I hope in guitar that um, I might be able to get to see a game live because uh, everything is so close, um, you know, that if I'm assigned, for example, the two morning games, um, then, then uh, maybe in, I could catch the late evening game uh, at another stadium um, because everything is so close, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be an adventure. It's actually my ninth, uh, world cup experience. Uh, I went, uh, my first world cup as a spectator, 1982 in Spain. And then of course I participated in two world cups as a coach, uh, in, uh, 1990, uh, with our Italian 90 team, I was the assistant coach. And I also was the assistant coach for the 89 uh, five-a-side team, which won a FIFA bronze medal um, in the first indoor World Cup, uh, futsal wow. style uh, mm -hmm. World Cup. And then of course, uh, 1994 was here in the USA, again, as a spectator. I was a spectator uh, in France World Cup, in Germany World Cup. And of course, worked, uh, this would be my third World Cup for Fox. Wow. That's incredible. Well, I want to come back to a little bit just the progression that you've seen. That's a question I'm going to come up uh, to here very shortly about just as you've seen soccer progress and the officiating accordingly. But I want to get back to just a little bit of your story um, as far as, you know, you've already talked about your progression and some of the, the, the stuff along the way. And you've already talked about some of those high points. Are there other high points or low points, things that you've kind of had to persevere through or, or just, just the normal progression of life, I guess? Well, I mentioned the game in Madison Square Garden as a high point. Yeah. Um, I also uh, did the 1988 Division I final NCAA. Mm. So in that game, it was Indiana hosting Howard at, at Indiana. Mm. And... Uh, in that game, um, I awarded a penalty kick in uh, approximately the 31st minute. Um, it was a controversial decision. Um, and back then, um, even though the game was televised, it wasn't televised live. So that mm -hmm. had to wait a month 
to see how the announcers described it. What was controversial about it was that uh, the player who was fouled was actually turning and coming away from the goal. Uh, was, there's clearly a foul there. Um, and by today's standard, it would be an easy penalty kick call. And certainly if there was VAR, um, the VAR would have recommended a review and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the referee would have decided on a PK. But back then, uh, PKs were in 88, PKs were a lot harder to come by. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and there was no video review. So, so uh, it's interesting. Seamus Mallon was the color commentator on the game. I'm still friendly with him today. So when live, he says, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a harsh call. And then when he, the replay comes on, he says, oh, well, he got him. Uh, you know, so so some, sometimes I do have the video clip of that. And sometimes when I do a clinic for referees, I show them uh, yeah. because, uh, some, you know, because it's, it's an interesting thing and how it happened. It's, uh, um, so that was for a while, a month, I waited. You talk about a low point. I waited to see how the national TV audience and everybody else who was going to be watching the game or, uh, you know, what they thought of the, of the decision. Yeah. Did you and your, you and your friend Essay bond over this? Well, uh, controversial did. penalty decisions that get vindicated later over uh, yeah, video. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, Essie of course has had a, a similar experience on a much, much bigger scale. Yeah, uh, you know, and he, and he suffered only for two or three days. Yeah, uh, that's true. <laughs> right. So when when then uh, uh, the pictures came out and they sh clearly showed a shirt pull, um, but uh, you know, and it, and of course our, his was in the World Cup. So there was millions of people that uh, were watching it, and and I don't and I don't know how many people were watching the NCAA final back in 1988. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It kind of comes full circle, you know. Now that you're talking about how the the uh, broadcasters describe that, and now you find yourself in that role. Um, so so I guess that leads us into that question about as you've seen the progression of soccer over quite a period of time. Are we trending in the right direction? I mean, I'm thinking more, we could talk broadly, but I'm thinking more on the officiating side of things. Are we doing things? Are we moving in the right direction? Have we improved? Are there areas you see us lacking behind? What do you, what's your thought on that? Well, I think the first major um, consideration where we can judge of improvement is when uh, it was decided that uh, officials needed to make a decision whether they're gonna concentrate on being a referee or an assistant referee. Uh, back uh, in the day, so to speak, um, uh, referees did both. Um, and of course, uh, a referees always wanted to be in the middle and concentrated on those skills. And when they were on the line, um, back then it wasn't even called assistant referee, it was called linesman. It was, yeah. a, it was, a, it was a lesser uh, role and the concentration uh, to get it right was um, not uh, as thorough, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so today, I mean, it's a major, major improvement. Uh, the concentration that assistant referees have to do to yeah. get the to get the offside flag, you know, raised or kept down correctly, and that mm -hmm. has added to uh, better officiating all around because that they, they're not thinking, hey, I should be in the middle because they're, right. not, they're, they're focusing on, on helping uh, the person in the middle by getting that offside decision uh, correct and then assisting wherever else is possible. Uh, and it's a really, it's sometimes a more challenging role than being yeah. in the middle. The fitness, the fitness to keeping up with the second last de defender is, is very demanding. Mm -hmm. the concentration and the focus is very demanding and I give credit uh, to all those officials that have decided uh, to be the best assistant referees they can be, and I don't, and and people should not look down upon that decision at all, at all, mm -hmm. uh, because it's an important part of the game. So I think number one, that's has added to better officiating all mm -hmm. around. Number two, um, refereeing at the highest level is no longer a hobby. Um, mm -hmm. You know when. When I was uh, 
got involved uh, with MLS, and that's not that long ago, 25 or so years. Yeah. Uh, it was still a hobby. Uh, we met with the referees uh, at the beginning of the season in person, and then uh, at All-Star break, uh, only twice. Mm. Uh, there was no internet. Uh, we, were, we were making copies of VHS tapes and sending, sending it to them. Wow. Mm. Uh, you know? And, and uh, I mean, even assignments were made by fax. Um, so, so wow, so, yeah. So, so, but, but as things got um, better, we were able to communicate online. Everybody had a computer. You were able to look at your games uh, right away and on replay and whatever. So all of that became better, but, but really, really had become better at the highest level is the fitness uh, mm. because they're, they're now meeting, the referees are meeting not twice a year, but twice a month, mm -hmm. absent, COVID, absent COVID. I mean, before COVID and now sure. back, yeah, back where we are. Um, and at those meetings, there's, uh, their fitness is monitored. They're wearing all kinds of fitness monitoring uh, gear and uh, in the, in the league or the organization pro. Uh, professional referee organization, which now manages the referees at all, you know, at all their high levels in, in the United States. Um, so that it monitors even when the referees are training at home. So, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, and, and they're, you know, the good referees are getting 20, 30 games in the middle. Um, they're getting paid a professional salary. They're full time and it's no longer a hobby, but, but the fitness level is unbelievable. Uh, in terms of being in the right position to get the to get the right angle to get the call correct, and even with all of that, there's still opportunity for video assistant referee to uh, help them. Uh, not you know, and that's the way it needs to be looked at. Looked at video right. assistant referee is a help uh, to the referees because you can't because of the angle you see the play. There might be a better angle. And often that angle is from behind the goal, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you remember, do you remember when five, six years ago in UEFA, they had an assistant referee on the goal line? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, remember that? So there was the additional assistant referee. That was part of the reason, because the best angle to see things in the penalty area is from behind the goal. So mm -hmm. with, with video assistant referee, we get, a, we get to see a different angle. And, uh, and that has made... Uh, for a lot less match critical incorrect decisions. Yeah. So you look at all those components, Gordy, you know, the, the fitness level, the concentration of the assistant mm -hmm. referee, VAR, the professionalism of the, of the staff, it's all led to Im improvement of officiating worldwide. Yeah. Well, and, and even, I don't know, you're still involved in the collegiate game um, and, you know, I think even at that level, we deal with that in Kansas City here with our college chapter. We have about 70 some officials that work and just the availability of video right after games. We're able to go back and watch our games over again. Um, we're able to use tools like Zoom and other webinar things. We're able to meet with some regularity and actually, you know, talk through some things and go, hey, this is where we'd like to do things differently. Points of emphasis are able to be disseminated, you know, there was a, a webinar last night from the NCAA where they're able to talk through points of emphasis and connect with officials across the country. I, you know, I, I think it's not probably, would it be fair to say it's not just the professional game, but all aspects of the game continue to, to advance and leverage technology and, and other aspects. Absolutely, uh, 100%, um, especially points of emphasis. I mean, I, I looked at, there's a website, Soccer America, I'm sure you're familiar with it, which has Soccer on TV, there was 122 college games listed for today. Wow. So, so, which you could watch on very, you know, ACC has their own network. Uh, ESPN Plus uh, carries the game. So, you know, and that's men's games, women's games. So, right. Yeah. All levels get to watch the game and get better. Watch your peers working. We certainly encourage that at the grassroots level. Come early before your game and watch somebody else work and learn from them, oh, you know. Fabulous. I mean, that's you, you. I know one of uh, 
one of the questions that someone from the audience that you know you sent me beforehand is what how can you you know how do you improve yourself well there's <laughs> the, the the fact that there are so many games on television okay you, yeah. as a young rep as a young referee you need to be watching those games okay mm -hmm. and and you know sometimes mistakes are made but they but they are corrected with VAR or other or otherwise and and as a referee, you should be saying to yourself, okay, there's a mistake, okay? Or there is, now that's a mistake that I'm not gonna make. Yeah. Or there's a, or there's a good call. I really <laughs> like that call. If I see there's something the same or similar, I now know how to deal with that. Yeah. So, so in addition to going to games early, like you mentioned, the number of games on TV that are available to, to, to watch the top level officials uh, it's it's amazing uh, uh, to be used as a tool to better your own self as a referee. Yeah, I, I I don't know if this is a fair statement. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, there's obviously differences between the game at various levels, but there's quite a bit of similarities. And so I think that when you're able to to look yeah, the speed, the physicality, all that stuff at the professional level, camera angles, all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know, would you agree that there's probably quite a bit of similar, so the referees are watching these games, they're able to go, hey, I can actually pull things from this and emulate the professionalism or other aspects to what the referee's doing. Is that, would that be fair to say there's probably not as big of a difference as we think there is? They're, 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 the game is the same. It's uh, the yeah. same play, you know, all over the world. The rules are the same, first of all. Uh, yeah. The game is the same. Yes, it's played differently at, at different levels because the skill level is different, the physicality is different. Um, so, so you, you know, you have to be prepared uh, for, for all of that, but even watching referees, body language, facial expressions, you get yeah. these quotes, you know, you can, you can, you know, you have to be yourself out there, but, but there's a lot of acting that goes on, uh, you know, as a referee, you know, sometimes you have to act, you know, have to act like this play, really upsets you i mean and so you you come you know and you talk to a player or you you give them one of these and you show a facial expression that's mm -hmm. uh, really meaningful um and that's why sometimes we say to referees get in front of a mirror and sit and see, mm -hmm. you know, see what you look like when you're making a call and yeah and, and, right so yeah of course there's so many things to learn yeah. Well, that, that goes into a question that we received from uh, from Joe, a, a different Joe. Uh, this wasn't you in an alter ego or something under the same name. Yeah, this was you don't, uh, yeah. you don't know. You don't know that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So uh, this question was, why has there been a movement uh, in his in his experience or at least in his what he's seeing? Why has there been a movement to take the referee's personality out of the style of refereeing and movement to a more robotic refereeing? That's the, the way the question has been phrased. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, I don't know what Joe's experience is. And and I've and I've seen in all sports officiating move towards a more robotic uh, type. Mm. I mean. The, back in the early days of NBA, and you know, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm talking when they were playing double headers and and, and mm. you know, I mean, referees were characters and they had personality. There was yeah. Sid Borger and Mendy Rudolph, and and you know, and mm. the same thing with hockey. But but you know, when they added an additional referee, when they went from two to three, when hockey went from one to two, um, when when assistant referees became assistant referees, not linesmen only, and teamwork. Mm -hmm. And teamwork was uh, an important part of soccer officiating. There's always that word consistency. So we talk, consistency has many meanings, mm -hmm. but so we want a referee to be consistent within that game, but, but players and coaches have the right to expect that they're gonna have a referee on Thursday, and why should the referee on Sunday be so much different? Yeah. So, right. So, so that consistency from game to game, not only with the same referee, but different referees. And, and you got to remember referees come from all kinds of backgrounds. There are mm -hmm. referees that who have played, there are referees who have coached, there are referees who haven't played, there are referees who haven't coached. There are referees that come from the Southern hemisphere where the game is played differently. 
uh, uh, where it's more technical. Yeah. The referees will come from um, the British Isles, where the game is played more differently, uh, maybe a more physical. So you 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 have all this melting pot of, mm -hmm. of uh, and and it's a little bit unfair to have all of those differences because the players and coaches don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's a move to bring to to take a little bit of the personality out and make it uh, more consistent. But at, mm -hmm. the, at the end of the day, Gordon, personality is still important in match control yeah. and player in, in, in uh, um, player management. Um, you know, I mean, back in the days of indoor, we had a referee, Gino DiPolito. He, mm -hmm. had, such, he had such a personality and he's so uh, remembered uh, by the players that whenever, you know, whenever I see a player who played in the indoor league, they don't ask me how I'm doing. They ask me, how's Gina? Wow. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, mm -hmm. but because that's, you know, they remember him from his personality. So you can't take personality away, but you have to use it when needed, but you also mm -hmm. have to have consistency because because that's what's expected by the players and the and the coaches and the fans. Yeah, I I think if if there's folks listening to this that aren't referees, hopefully they're understanding the challenge that faces match officials in what you're describing, trying to balance all of this, right? And and I think the statement that we had a we had an official that uh, I worked with last night in a collegiate game that that's, was was talking about one of the coaches on the club side, and he went up to him before a game. He goes he goes my favorite memory of this coach was he came to me before a game at state cup a couple of years ago and he shook his hand. He said, good luck today. Be invisible. That's what he told the referee. So there's this, right. I think there's this feeling overall. It's like, no, the best referees are the ones that go completely unnoticed and they walk off the game and the players are saying all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think, I, I think we probably both agree that there's at least some truth in that, but maybe that's part of the push, right? Like if you have personality, I, I don't know. Well, this I've heard that, of course. You know, the yeah. best referee, the best referee is the one that you haven't seen. Um, how do you referee a game where there could be only one goal in the game, and that could be a penalty kick, or mm -hmm. there could be a penalty kick situation which you don't give? So how you it's it's impossible, almost impossible, to referee a soccer game and be invisible. Because, yep. at, because at the end of the day, there's going to be a match critical decision uh, somewhere in a game. Otherwise, it's a vanilla game. The only way, the only way you can be invisible is the whole game is vanilla. There's no match critical decision. There's no penalty or no penalty. There's no goal line decision. There's no, was it a red or was it a yellow or was it a second yellow decision? And, you know, was it offside or was it not offside? So those are the four match critical decisions. I mean, and so when you have to make one of them in a game, you're no longer invisible because it, yeah. because it can decide the outcome of the game. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there are many sports uh, where the referee, you know, has to make multiple, multiple decisions in a game. But mm -hmm. I think soccer is the only sport where one decision, one decision determines the outcome. Yeah. Well, I'm going to clip that and record it and give it to some of these coaches when they come out and tell us that we have to be invisible. Hey, yeah. Dr. Dr. Joe said, no, you're exactly right though. You're exactly right. There's, there's moments where you have to step up and make the decision and uh, it's not possible to just blend into the background. Absolutely. Um, so we had a couple more questions from, from Joe. Um, so this one's interesting. Do you think the MLS should promote better silent behavior from, from fans specifically towards referees? Yeah, I, I, I was happy you sent that to me in advance because it gave me some time to think about it. Yeah. Um, you know, fan experience in all sport, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, part of it is not only rooting for your team, but especially in situations where the referee has to make a decision, you know, you, you're going to come down, you're going to show your displeasure mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on a particular call, whatever. I mean, you could boo. You could, uh, you know, you could wave. You could, you'll see it again on replay. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, there was a movement in FIFA where they would not show 
replays on, on the giant screen, on the mm. so-called Jumbotron. But now everybody has an iPhone and they're watching yeah. the game. And so everybody knows right now, you know, whether, whether the decision of the referee is correct or incorrect. And they have a right to express their displeasure. They don't have a right to throw things. They don't have a right to, you know, to, to uh, uh, use foul and abusive language uh, against the referee. Uh, they don't have a, uh, you know, they don't have those uh, rights um, any more than they do to, to, against the player. Um, but it's very difficult to control. Uh, yeah. and, it's part, and it's part of the fan experience. Um, so, um, and, and like we said before, at the end of the day, not everybody's going to agree with every decision. You know, one team, the decision is favorable to one team and against the other. And the fans of the other have a right to express their displeasure, but only in acceptable ways. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. It is difficult to police. So when I thought about that question, I was like, oh my word, how do we, you know, how do you go about addressing those kinds of issues? It's a, it would be a difficult, a tall order, let's put it that way. Well, NCAA, for example, uh, as you know, because you do college as well as you said, I'm still involved and I am um, yeah. as an assigner, uh, NCAA reads, uh, the, the, the announcer is supposed to read before the game, the NCAA fan behavior code, right? Uh, and, right. And, and, right? And, and so um, that's a step. Uh, you're, you're familiar with uh, the situation in Mexico with the Mexico national team where mm -hmm. uh, fan behavior towards the opposing goalkeeper uh, when, when he or she takes a goal kick it right. crosses, the, crosses the line and, and uh, FIFA uh, has um, and CONCACAF uh, penalized them uh, they played Three World Cup qualifiers in a stack without any fans. Yeah, as punishment, and that hurts. You know mm -hmm. that that you know that that hurts financially as well as the motivational aspect for the team to play better. Right. Um, and and, uh, and they've given the referee the power when fan behavior of that sort um, happens. The referee can stop the game. And bring both play both teams to the center circle, right? And they announce the rules over the loudspeaker system. They could now go back and play. And if it happens again, the same thing can happen, or by the referee, or he can take the team, he or she can take the teams off the field. Uh, we might yeah. see this. We might see this at the World Cup this uh, this year. Um, where you know you just never know. Well, especially to address some of the more vulgar, like what you're describing, or things that are, you know, homophobic or racist or anything like that, that have no part of soccer, you know. Exactly. Uh, like you said, the displeasure, the passion, we certainly don't want to keep that from the game, the passion of the game and fans being avid supporters. But you're right, that extra layer of what's inappropriate, it doesn't have a place. And uh, it is good to see these leagues and in, in groups take some steps to address that. There's no doubt. So you talk about passion. So one of the, one of the considerations of VAR uh, is that fans now are, don't know whether they should cheer a goal because if there's a close offside, there's a, there's a close offside decision. They don't know which way it's going. I mean, to the naked eye, to the naked eye, you can't tell, right? Live, yeah. right? Depending yeah. on where you're sitting and the angle and, and uh, to the, to the uh, point, and I, I'm sure, your listeners know this, but um, FIFA will be using at the World Cup a new technology called semi-automatic offside, mm -hmm. where there will be there will be multiple cameras around the stadium that will focus on every player's part of their every player's body that can score a goal, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. taking a picture fifty images a second, so that they will instantly know. Uh, at the moment the ball is kicked or headed, whether that player is in an offside position. So mm. this is going to speed up and make 100% accurate the decision on offside position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the referee still has to decide, 
Did the player interfere with play? Did the player interfere with an opponent? Did the player gain an advantage? All of these things that come into the offside final decision, but at least they will now know whether the player was in an offside position or not. So is that going to lead to, I know the criticism of some, uh, the ways that VAR has been utilized in other parts of the world is that it feels like we're kind of splitting hairs and going like, oh, his toenail was offside or something like that. Is this going to be a positive move for the game globally? Well, that's, that's the question. So, sure. it, you know, there, there are some that think that we're calling offside too closely. That benefit of the doubt should go to attacking soccer. Uh, some, you know, I mean, FIFA 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer said, you know, even used to be offside. Now even is onside. Okay. Mm. And so in MLS, for example, where they don't have as many cameras, they're, they're not drawing the offside line with VAR and they're giving benefit of the doubt to attacking soccer, causing some controversy. But in this World Cup, there will be probably be less goals even because mm. offside is going to be called so tightly and so accurately. And the mm. offside rule, you know, offside rule is one of those black and white. That, that part of it is a black and white decision. Was the player yeah. in the offside position or not? The rest is subjective. Uh, you know, whether he, an advantage is gained, whether he interferes with an opponent um, or, or makes a play on the ball. Right. Right. It will be interesting to see. And it sounds like you may have your hands full from your perspective as an analyst there. So yeah, I'm sure you're going to add some more cheat sheets to be ready for that conversation. Yeah. I don't know, I bring, I'll be bringing mine with me and, and making them more clear, easier to, to read. So maybe Mark go. Plattenberg will use them as well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So one final question is Joe asks, um, is it, and I'll just read the question as it's written. Um, is it better to referee with arrogance or with a more subdued, friendly slash straightforward demeanor? That, that, that's a difficult one because it, it's situational. Sure. You know, it, it, it's situational. There, you, every referee has baggage so to speak, positive baggage and negative baggage. That's the baggage being the experience that he or she has had with the team or teams that they're going into a game to officiate. So, so you, you're, you're, you know, you would like to think that you're walking on the field and you're welcome, mm. you know, you're welcome because the teams, they either know you or seen you officiate whatever. And you could certainly start the game without being an arrogant person. Mm -hmm. But, but, at, but, but there, there may come a time where in that game where you, ha you have to apply the law when no one is gonna like it. Yeah. And, that may be, and that may be perceived as arrogant because, because um, it's, just, it's just the nature of the game. So, uh, you know, so the question is difficult. Um, you don't yeah. have to be, you don't have to be arrogant. You can, but, but there are, there's, there may come a time in the game where, where you just have to lay down the law and that will be perceived as arrogance. Great answer. Yeah, absolutely. So you alluded to this question earlier. We'll kind of add, this will be our, um, we got maybe just wrap it up here with a couple of little things, but the, the question was, what's your best advice for young referees trying to cl climb the ladder? You talked about being able to watch games. Were there other things that came to mind for you? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're a player, you know, and you've decided to do some refereeing, continue playing. Uh, play, 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 a, play at the highest level you can get to because it's going to help you uh, as a referee because you're going to, you know, you're going to know. Um, when something happens on the field because you've experienced as a player, you're going to understand the pain. You're going to understand the emotion. Uh, if you've done some coaching, you know, you, we mentioned Essie Bahamas. Uh, Essie Bahamas has a B coaching license that he got. He decided, you know, that uh, it was going to help him as a referee. And if you're coaching, you're going to understand team tactics. 
He's going to understand strategy. You're going to understand uh, set plays. Uh, you're going to figure out um, in a short period of time uh, how the other team is organizing their attack. Is there a significant player that the play is going to go through? And you're going to have to then position yourself uh, accordingly. Uh, you know, referees today do scouting. Uh, it's a good idea to, if you're going into a game, to know how the teams play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to look at a game on TV or on, on the computer or whatever. Um, and so all of these things, the, the, the playing and the coaching, um, and obviously refereeing as many as you can, but these playing and the coaching is, gives you what they call, hopefully, uh, a feel for the game. Mm -hmm. So you, you, walk on, you walk on the field, you walk on the field and you're comfortable. You know, because you've been there before and you're going to look comfortable. You, you've been there as a player. You've been on the sidelines as a coach and, you, and you're going to get it done. Um, last but not least, I, you know, as an assigner, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of referees soliciting games. Uh, mm -hmm. when, as a, as a, an assigner, it's my job to put the best referee in, in the situation as I look, as I see it. So, so that, that always kind of offended me because I'm gonna look for the very best referees to work in my conference. And I would recommend that uh, if you're very good, if you're a good referee, people are gonna find you as a, mm. as a good referee. You're gonna advance because they, there's a shortage of referees and there's mm -hmm. even a greater shortage of good referees. Yeah. Or, great, or great referees. So if you're good, because you've played, because you've coached, because you do a lot of games, because you watch games on TV, all of these things, you put it all together. If you're good, you're going to advance. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. Well, that gives some tangible steps for uh, referees to take. And I know that's an encouraging word. We have some local referees that, that wonder, should I go... I have opportunities to play in college. Should I go do that? And uh, I've told them many times, and now I feel better about my answer. Go play. You go play. So Absolutely. very good. Um, well, I'll ask you one last question, then, I'll, then we'll wrap up. But uh, this one, just something that came off uh, the top of my head, and I sent this to you in advance. But how does top-level soccer, both at the domestic and the international level, trickle down to grassroots, especially as it affects referees? And let me give you the motivation behind that question. One of the things that I think that I see is, and I know the MLS took some steps to kind of address this, just as one example, is like the swarming of the referee. Um, as we start to see players that watch in, in any sport, and I do basketball as well, um, in any sport, as they watch professional players go about their business, inevitably that's going to infiltrate and kind of trickle down. Do you see this in any particular way in our country, especially with soccer? Yeah. I mean, dissent is uh, mm -hmm. something that's difficult to control um, because there's a difference between an emotional response and dissent. Yeah. So, so it's a soccer is a very emotional game. And, and part of the problem is, so say basketball, which you just referenced. So you get dissent and you're going to call a technical foul. Right. Right. And, they, and, and that might add up to two points or I'm, I'm, I'm not that. Right. Savvy. Yeah. Right. So, so or one and loss of possession of the ball. But there's that. But there's 90 percent, you know, 90 points in the game. So now you've given a yellow card for dissent. So now. So now. And fair enough, because we're trying to get rid of dissent. But now you possibly affecting how the game is played because there might be opportunity for a second yellow card for that player. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now you've reduced the team to 10, which, which now changes the game. I, there's no sport. There's no sport that I know of where you play shorthanded when you've, when you've been sanctioned. Mm -hmm. So, right? Yep. Right? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. Even a 10 minute misconduct in, 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 in hockey is they play at full strength. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, FIFA at the younger levels are uh, experimenting with the so-called sin bin where, mm -hmm. where, where, where you can maybe 
uh, you know, when you put a player in the sin bin for 10 minutes, uh, and, and that's a way without conceivably, without affecting the outcome of the game. It's a difficult challenge. Okay. Um, uh, I, th I think it's always been a challenge in MLS. Uh, I think Pro has done a good uh, job. Um, and you could see, uh, you know, before every game that I do, the MLS game, I do a little referee research. And you could see that last year, this referee averaged 3.7 yellows a game, mm -hmm. now averaging 5.6. Okay, so mm -hmm. because of the initiatives that they have, one of which is descent, the other which is stopping a promising attack, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, time wasting. Um, so, and, and, and the descent and the marbing up, mobbing of the referee, that the, the only way, there's only two ways to control it either by the referee or by the league. So, right. so the, referee, the referee has tools to control it, but it's difficult for the referee because it could seriously, uh, because he cannot be invisible. <laughs> yeah, he, right. That, because he cannot be invisible when he's controlling it. And the league can control it by fining and suspending players post game. okay? For, right. for, uh, I mean, it's done in the, you know, in the premiership where this is done with fines to the club when, when, when their players mob uh, a referee. So that's another way that it can be done. But the fine, you know, if the club pays the fines and the players don't pay the fines, I'm not so sure that that, 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 that works. Yeah. Yeah, that brings, yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed our conversation, Dr. Joe, and I do want to give you kind of the last word if there's anything that you want to share with the Check Complete podcast audience as we finish our conversation. Well, it just it's been fun for me too and and, and uh, you know, it helps me bring everything together and yeah. um, and I and, and I hope uh, I hope that uh, you know, I was going through my paperwork uh, just prior to and I found my 1993 registration card. Oh, look at that! <laughs> yeah, as as a as a, uh, I was once a national referee uh, in Connecticut. Grade 14 was national. Um, so, so you know, it's just it's just a fun. Come on, if you played a little bit, you coach a little bit, then you should have an opportunity to referee because it's just a fun way to stay involved. Um, and you're really making a contribution back, uh, you know, to the game uh, because uh, the game the game requires officiating at the, you know, that's at the same level that the game is being played. Yeah. Very good. Well, you, uh, I really appreciate it again. You helped us get better today, and you answered some fun questions. We really appreciate it, and we'll be list listening and looking forward to hearing. Uh, you from Qatar in the World Cup. That'll be very exciting. Hope that's a wonderful and safe trip for you. So once thank again, Dr. So Joe, thank you so much. No, thank you. Really appreciate it. The Check Complete podcast is brought to you in part by JF Consulting Tax Preparation and Bookkeeping. Taxes suck. We can help. Visit jfcokc.com. This has been episode 15 of the Check Complete podcast. Thank you so much for engaging with us in this episode. Uh, we really appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed our content. I want to say thank you to Zed. We appreciate you taking time for this. This has been an awesome, great conversation with you. Once again, if you find yourself and your story colliding with his in any way, don't hesitate to reach out. He's a great guy to know. Um, uh, also, a huge thank you to Jeff Swartzel, our uh, old reliable pro AR. He's not old. Jeff, you're not old. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Uh, and then Dr. Joe Matchnick uh, for his time today. What a wonderful opportunity to connect with him as well. A couple of opportunities or items to be aware of uh, moving forward. We are super excited to find ways to connect with you via email. More opportunities coming that way very soon, so stay tuned for that. And then some opportunities for you to connect with us uh, through a Patreon uh, to provide you more outstanding content, exclusive content, all sorts of opportunities as we're working out some of the details on that. So stay tuned for that. It'll be awesome, awesome ways for you to continue to engage with the mission and vision of the Check Complete podcast.
So yeah. Yeah. Good stuff coming up. Great stuff coming up. Great stuff coming up. So uh, please make sure you engage with us. Right, Please Zed? do. Please do. I mean, th we are only as good as our community. You know? That's I mean, right. We harped on that earlier. Um, and it's, it's very true. And so there's a lot of really, really cool things on the horizon. So definitely stay tuned. That's right. So like, follow, subscribe, all of that stuff. All that right? fun stuff. Like, comment, subscribe, retweet. Send a fax to your aunt that doesn't get emails. Everything. That's all right. of that. Aunt Lando. Linda, yeah. yeah, Linda. Linda, listen. Listen, Linda. Listen, Linda. Listen, Linda. So yes, subscribe. Right here. We're gonna put that right here. Good old Vanna White. That's right. Like, follow, subscribe uh, on Twitter and Instagram at check underscore complete on Facebook, check complete podcast. Email us info at checkcompletepodcast.com. Engage with us that way. Uh, on YouTube, of course, if you're watching that, you already know that. If you're listening to us on one of the many major podcasting services, you're also able to watch us online, like I said, at the YouTubes. Um, if you have exciting things that you'd like to share with us or just some comments about how wonderful Zed was today as a, as a guest host, uh, we'd love to hear that from you. If you do have some negative feedback, if for some reason you have that, we do invite you um, to write that on the back of a new 10-in-1 soccer referee kit. Uh, this is the perfect referee kit for every serious, serious soccer referee. For those days that you are in the middle of a game and you forget you're the ref, uh, you'll be wearing an armband that lets you know who you are. That's right. So it only it retails at a, a low 35.49. So put it on the back of that. Send us, send it to us, and we'll be sure to get right back to you about that. Yeah, that's right. Zed, you're the man. Gordy, you're the best. Oh, thanks for watching the Check Complete podcast. We'll see you next time.